Think about it. What would you do if you had a bad run of luck? The chances are that you'd end up turning to government agencies for a bit of help. I think the social welfare system is a real blessing. It shouldn't be taken for granted. It shouldn't be abused. My husband is disabled. Without the benefit system, we would have found things very difficult. Here in the UK, millions of us need to ask for help every year in the form of benefits, legal aid and health care. But there are some people who are out there to cheat the system out of as much as they can. They're cheating the people who pay into the system, the general public. How are these people managing to get away with this? But those people who are trying to get rich from the public purse are now being sniffed out by investigators who want to make sure that as much money as possible is available to those who need it. This is the world of saints and scroungers. Coming up, the scroungers that are out to beat the system. A jet-setting mystic who claimed benefits despite earning pennies from heaven. They were famously made in foreign currency, including uh, Sri Lankan rupee, American dollars, uh, and in euros over in France as well. A woman that conned the council for three years by saying she was too sick to leave the house. It was clear from the surveillance that we conducted over a two-month period that her mobility was not as restricted as she had claimed in her application form for benefits. And those who rightly deserve a helping hand. The man who found himself homeless after the breakup of his marriage. I was totally devastated to the point where I find it hard to cope with life. I just had to be on my own. Being the sole breadwinner in any family is a huge responsibility, but at least you can take pride in the fact that you're putting food on the table and a roof over your family's head. Imagine the feeling then when you know you can't provide because you can't work because you're just too ill. For most of us, it would be hugely demoralising. But for a benefit cheat, it's a big opportunity. Meet married father of three, Yunus Algahar. He's unfortunately been unemployed since 1999 due to suffering severe migraines and has been reliant on government support to help him and his family. The family lived in rented accommodation in Kingswood, a leafy, affluent suburb 18 miles south of London, and he was helped out by Rygate and Banstead Borough Council. Julian Ellicott is a local councillor there. Rygate and Manchester Borough Council is responsible for paying uh, a number of benefits, housing benefit, council tax benefit in particular, and we pay those to people in need of them, mainly unemployed, um, people on low incomes. People just like Eunice Algahar. Eunice Algahar was claiming housing benefit and council tax benefit from Rygate and Manchester Borough Council, and he was also claiming income support from the Department for, for Work and Pensions. Sounds fair enough, but when Algahar moved, the landlord of his new property got in touch with the council and an investigation kicked off. The case landed on the desk of one of the council's fraud investigators, who, due to the nature of his work, has asked to remain anonymous. It's common practice for, for the landlord of a property to, to ring up the council and inform them that a new, a new tenant has moved in because the tenant then becomes liable for, for the council tax bill. And this was the case with, with Eunice Alcala, the landlord called up and informed the council uh, of the tenancy conditions. It transpired through that initial phone call that the landlord was charging nearly double the amount Eunice Algahar was claiming. What was going on? The fraud team decided to take a look at Algahar's original claims. As part of the investigation, I contacted the, um, the letting agents for the property in Kingswood and asked them to provide a copy of the, um, the genuine tenancy agreement. The agreement they provided me with showed that the, uh, the rental amount was actually £2,700 a month. However, the agreement that Eunice Algahar provided the council stated that his rent was only £1,400 per month. So, why was Algahar paying nearly twice the amount of rent he was claiming? The amount of extra money Eunice Algahar was forking out to his landlord didn't sit well with someone who was supposedly reliant on income support. The investigators widened their search. It's common practice to do what's called open source intelligence searching, which is basically putting a name in, into an internet website, um, searching and seeing what comes up. Uh, on this occasion, um, I found that Eunice Algahar was, uh, had quite a high profile um, public um, presence on the internet, as well as his own website, um, all which were linking him to uh, an organisation called the Messiah Foundation International. From the, the web searches, there were lots of pictures of, of Eunice Algahar in various situations. I was able to compare these pictures to what we already held on the, the benefit claim form from his passport, and from that I was able to say they, they were the same person. 
referred to online as His Holiness and claiming to be a mystic, writer and poet, Al Gahar is in fact the chief executive of the Messiah Foundation, whose website claims to promote divine love and the reduction of hatred, all of which sounds marvellous. The investigator carried on searching and discovered Al Gahar had previously claimed housing benefit for a house just five miles away in Coolsdon. From looking at the, the claim paperwork for, for Coulson, I discovered a, a pattern with what happened with Kingswood, um, that there were discrepancies in the, the rental amount, the tenancy conditions and the agreement that had been provided to the council. So, another claim. This time the landlord charged Algahar £2,800 per month, and again he was only claiming just over half the amount. So where was all the extra cash coming from? It appeared from the information we got so far that Eunice Algahar was to, uh, renting quite um, expensive properties, quite lux luxurious properties, and then declaring to the council that the rent was significantly lower to that that he was actually paying. So that's two properties claimed for in the same way. A pattern was definitely emerging, but so far it made no sense. Investigators kept digging and found that another property had been claimed for in very much the same way in the nearby borough of Bromley. The property was in the town of Keston, 15 miles away. The investigation was getting even wider. It is important for councils to work together um, because, mainly because people can obviously move around from one area to another and therefore they will claim benefits from different councils over a period of time. So the next stage was to, to contact them to, uh, to verify that their claim was, was genuine as well. When I got in touch with my, my counterpart at the London Borough of Bromley, uh, they established that the, the same pattern had been followed with that, that claim as well. Yet another property rented in the same way. Eunice Algahar was claiming £1,600 per calendar month, but was actually paying 2850 The sums just weren't adding up. It certainly looked like there were three fraudulent claims in two boroughs, with one objective. To get the council to pay half your rent so you can live in a house you would never normally be able to afford. Something had to be done to find out where all this cash was coming from. He told the council and the DWP he wasn't working. If there was something dodgy going on, the council weren't going to let it slide. We'll find out later if they get the proof they need. The police then undertook the search of the property, seizing numerous bits of documents uh, and taking photos as, as they went. For now, it's farewell to the scroungers that are trying to fleece the system. And let's say hello to those who we call our saints, the people who do everything to make sure that those in need of help, who are too proud or simply don't know how to help themselves, can get what they deserve. On any given single night, in England alone, it's estimated that there are around 2,000 people sleeping rough. And there are any number of reasons why people become homeless. But I don't know about you, I'd always assumed that the process of becoming homeless would take weeks or months. Is it possible that you could wake up in the morning without any idea that you'd be homeless the same night? Meet Simon Griffin. In 2011, he left his home and found himself with nowhere to live. Simon had been happily married for five years. He had a young daughter, a nice home, and a rewarding job as a technical engineer. He was a man who had everything he'd always wanted, but one night Simon's world was turned upside down when he and his wife split. I was shocked at the time and I didn't think it was going to be uh, forever, I thought it was going to be short term. Even though it was tough, Simon took the decision to leave the family home. I didn't want my daughter to see us arguing, falling out, I don't, I don't believe that's right. So I left the family house to let the heat die down, which I thought it would. Initially, Simon stayed with family and friends, but when it became clear that the breakup was permanent, things went from bad to worse. When it really had sunk in that there was no relationship there no longer, I was totally devastated, to, to the point where I, I found it hard to cope with life, to cope with people. I just had to be on my own, in my own little world. It was, it was the start of a breakdown for me. With his mental and emotional state deteriorating, Simon began spending more and more time alone in his car. When I was in my car, I, I used to just start processing things in my head. 
and that used to get me more and more and more depressed. But at the time, I was just processing it, not to get myself depressed, but it was just getting me low and lower and lower. Simon struggled to keep up with the 12-hour shifts he was working as an engineer and took a part-time job as a cleaner instead. Even this, though, proved too much for him, and his attendance at work was low. Simon was suffering from depression. He stopped taking care of himself, and with no plan for the future, the days spent in his car drifted into weeks as he withdrew further and further away from the outside world. I've come down to the place where Simon ended up to find out more about this very difficult time in his life. Hi, Simon. Hi, Matt. So this is a, a spot of particular significance for you. Yes. Why? I spent a lot of time over there, sleeping in my car, and times were bad. So you were in, in your car, and was that for the day or for the night or...? For about two months. For, for the whole two yeah. months? Yeah. What's that like? It's awful. Really low. Bad as things can get. And what was it that, that brought you to that situation? What was going through your mind at that stage? Um, I was I was poorly depressed. Life wasn't worth living. I was just at an all-time low. What time of year was it? It was um, March into April time. It was a bad bad winter. It was cold, windy. Most of this lane down here was flooded and not nice at all. Did you feel like, at least inside the car, you could control everything? Is that part of it? Yeah, yeah. It was because I didn't, I didn't have to see anyone. I didn't have to answer to anyone. What's happened to work during this time? Because presumably you're still employed, you haven't I, left work. I was, in, I was employed, but I was taking a lot of uh, sick days uh, because I was just not up to it. Simon was suffering from clinical depression, but he just didn't realise it. I kept churning through past memories. My wife, my daughter, how things are not going to be the same no more. I can't come home from work, my daughter be there, take her to the park. The car had now broken down, and his depression meant he only left it when he was desperate for food. He couldn't even bring himself to visit his daughter. This is a sadly familiar situation for those working with people who find themselves homeless. The one thing that goes when you become homeless is uh, your own self-respect and your own belief that there is any hope and that you can do anything about your situation. The police regularly patrolled the area where Simon was parked and would briefly check to see he was OK. One night, though, the officer on duty took more time than usual and asked Simon how he'd ended up there. As Simon began to open up, it became clear he had nowhere else to go and really needed help. When did you become homeless? And, and then was that the first time you realised you were? Yeah, because homelessness to me is, is somebody who ain't got nowhere to go, but you know, I, I suppose if I wasn't ill, I could have found somewhere to go, but because of my situation and I was ill and wanting, you know, I didn't really see it as homeless. You know, I got my own car and, you know, sort of a roof over my head. Uh, but it was a lot of, I needed a lot of help. A so, lot of help. So what did he do for you in the first instance? He, he was ringing um, different authorities trying to get me accommodation. They was coming back negative and he didn't give up. <laughs> he kept going, he did. After spending three hours trying to find him somewhere to spend the night, the police officer managed to persuade Simon to give him the phone number of a friend that he hadn't seen since the breakup of his marriage. My friend, he was, um, he was surprised to see me because not many people had seen me. And I'm sure he was concerned, and I think he was trying to make conversation, but I was trying to um, avoid the conversation and make the situation go away so I could just be alone still. The very next day, the police officer who'd found Simon, together with the local council, arranged an appointment for him at the Canaan Trust, a charity that aims to give homeless people the help they need to get back on their feet. It seemed like just the place Simon needed, but would they be able to take him in? When I got to the hostel, this... Uh, I was referred there, but it wasn't a guaranteed place. So I've come a step 
out of getting out my car. But this could go either ways. I could get knocked back down if I couldn't get in. Or it's going to be hard work. We'll find out later if Simon gets through the interview and receives the help he so clearly needs. When we first saw Simon, um, he was clearly very emotional, very upset. Dependent on government help was Fiona Gilhooley, who, aged 42, had a car accident, which left her with severe back pain, weakness down her leg and right side, and depression. All of which meant she could barely walk down the street or even leave the house. Dr Javid abdul is an independent medical expert. We've asked him to tell us more about what Fiona Gilhooley might have been going through. If you had a right-sided weakness or a back pain, you can be expected to have difficulty in walking, difficulty in picking up heavy objects, particularly on the right side, if that was where your weakness was, and restricted movement in general. Unable to work, Fiona was eligible for disability living allowance, which meant she was able to buy a brand new people carrier to help her get around. Incapacity benefit and income support. Disability benefits are vital to that person's needs. It helps them maintain a normal function of life as much as possible. If they weren't available, everyday living could become impossible. But suspicions as to Gil Hooley's eligibility for benefits were raised in December 2010, following an anonymous tip-off made to the Department for Work and Pensions. If the suspicions were true, Gil Hooley could have been wrongly paid £40,000. Unit fraud manager Linda Russell and her team were called in to investigate. The allegation suggested that Fiona Gilhooley was not as disabled as she had said on her benefit claim forums. Fiona Gilhooley was claiming disability living allowance because she had had an accident. Following that accident, she said that she needed aids to walk and a wheelchair and she could only walk between 10 to 20 yards without feeling discomfort. Yes, but gathering evidence on a woman that could barely leave the house was going to be tricky. On a disability living allowance lifestyle case, which, in which someone says that they're virtually unable to walk, the best way to gather evidence is through surveillance and through neighbours' statements. So the team set out with their cameras, and the first thing they filmed threw serious doubt on her claims. Filmed over a two-month period, it became clear that her mobility was not as restricted as she'd initially declared. She was able to walk to the shops, to the doctors, and was even spotted gardening. Now, that doesn't look like someone with a severe disability to me. But I'm no expert. What do you reckon, Doc? So this person is walking with a normal gait. There's no abnormality in her speed or rhythm of walking. She doesn't have a limp. She's got normal coordination. So there's no evidence of a weakness here at all of which she complained. Here she is carrying a heavy watering can in her right hand. That's the side she complained of weakness. With all the evidence gathered, it looked like Gil Hooley had some explaining to do to the DWP, and she was invited down for an interview under caution. These meetings are a chance for the investigators to put forward their evidence and get to the bottom of exactly what's going on. She brought with her an advocacy worker as her representative. During that time when she came into the interview, she had a single crutch which she leaned on and was showing signs of discomfort as if she was in pain. However, this was a complete contradiction to the footage that we had viewed in the surveillance. From gardening to grimacing, it seemed like Gil Hooley's disability had become worse in the space of a single month. Before the footage was shown, the surveillance footage that we'd gathered was shown, Fiona Gil Hooley denied all knowledge that her condition had improved. Fiona Gil Hooley suggested that the mobility of the person on the surveillance was her sister and that they looked similar. Could the DWP investigators have filmed the wrong woman? I mean, we all make mistakes from time to time. Once we showed the footage, she then declined to continue with the interview. The interview had to be stopped, and Fiona Gilhooley refused to be interviewed thereafter. In order to establish just who was in the footage, investigators got in touch with the sister, who refused to be interviewed on the advice of Fiona's solicitor. We checked with neighbours, and they were clearly able to say that her sister and her, although alike, that the footage was her. Fiona Gilhooley had, in fact, been seriously ill following her accident. However, her condition had improved considerably, but she just didn't get round to telling anyone for three years. It's a customer's responsibility when they're claiming disability living allowance or any other 
social security benefit to notify any changes in their condition when they're claiming any of these benefits. It was time for Fiona to prepare for court. Fiona Gilhooly pled guilty to a £40,000 overpayment of disability living allowance and income support at Haddington Sheriff Court in May 2013. She was sentenced to 12 months in prison. Not only did Gil Hooley go to jail, but the DWP submitted a confiscation order, meaning her house has been sold to repay the money she fiddled. This was a great result for DWP, as it uncovered benefits that were in payment incorrectly, and this money can be used to pay people that should be receiving the benefits. So if you're thinking about defrauding the council or any other government agency, well, think again, because you may end up paying more than you think. OK, let's leave the deceitful world of fakes and frauds and turn our attention to people that really need the help of the welfare state. Following a breakdown and suffering from depression, Simon Griffin was no longer able to work and was living in his car. I was getting so depressed, I couldn't pull myself out of it. I couldn't think anything but negative thoughts. A passing police officer arranged an appointment for him at a local hostel. It was very clear that he was extremely depressed. Um, he'd withdrawn from all the support that was around him. Um, so it was clear that, you know, somebody had to offer him some support and some help to move him forwards. Having been at rock bottom for so long, could this be the route to recovery that Simon really needed? I was really nervous, really. I was shaking at the time. I went, I went in for my interview. Uh, two guys interviewed me. Seeing the state that Simon was in, the support workers at the Trust had to make a very quick decision. If they rejected him, he was in danger of slipping even further into the grip of his depression. And with no alternative, he'd have to go back to sleeping in his car. They popped out for about five minutes or so, and they come back in and um, said they've got a room for me, which at the time it was like, it was a relief that one, I was um, out of my car, and two, this is the road to start a new life. It was great news for Simon. And that very same day, he was welcomed into one of the three hostels that Canaan Trust runs. Russ Lolding remembers their very first meeting. When Simon walked through the door physically, how did he look? Um, well, um, not well. Um, it was obviously um, very distressed. Um, and, you know, I don't think it was a pleasant experience for him to come through that door. I think it took a lot of courage for him to get there. He'd obviously not been sleeping very well, not been eating very well, and overall just didn't look very well. So what were Simon's immediate needs? What could you do for him? What could you see? Well, the immediate need was to get him a roof over his head, which obviously we did quite quickly. Um, and then beyond that, it was just um, trying to get him to focus on what he had to look forward to rather than what he'd lost. What other problems were associated? Because he was clearly ill. Yes. And we got him registered at a GP and we um, looked at getting him assessed for um, his depression um, and getting medication. The doctor confirmed that Simon was clinically depressed and prescribed him a course of medication to help him get better. Russell was then able to help Simon tackle the more practical issues, like his financial situation. Simon, was, Simon had taken on a part-time job, but unfortunately, because he was so depressed, um, he wasn't really turning up to that. He'd been off more than he'd been in. And the next stage was to talk to his employer and sort things out there. Unfortunately, he wasn't in a fit state to work. The next stage was to sort out benefits. So we gave him advice on the benefit system, worked out what was the best benefit for him at that time. Unable to work because of his depression, Simon was entitled to employment and support allowance, which helped with his immediate financial needs. The next step was to get Simon integrating with others and dealing with the issues that had led to him becoming depressed in the first place. I had been isolated for a while, so I really didn't speak to people. I've always been such a, a person who I keep my stuff to myself. So opening up to people, which I have to, well, there's no point in me being there because they won't be able to solve anything. It was very hard for me. It was really hard for me. So we gave Simon a friendly ear, um, you know, start to chat to him about what he liked doing and, and you know, about the circumstances that had led him to us um, and found that Simon was quite quick to, to open up about, you know, what he felt had caused the problems and how he, he was dealing with that. He was, he was quite open about that. 
it was kind of a relief. It's like sharing your problem. And somebody who's there to say, well, that problem ain't really that big. And if we did this, or we looked at it from that way, your problem ain't so big. Simon's issues were now being dealt with in a much more controlled environment. And with his benefits relieving the immediate financial burden, he was now ready to take the next step to get him to a stage where he could feel ready to return to the workplace once again. He asked if he could study maths and English at the Trust's college, and Russell set it up for him. Individuals can address their literacy and their numeracy uh, uh, needs. Uh, they can sit their exams up to level three in both English and in maths. Simon also threw himself into other more practical courses like cookery and DIY, so he was ready for living in the outside world all by himself. How many months after he was first brought in here uh, did you feel he was ready to move on? It was coming up to the six-month mark and we felt, you know, he was ready to, to get a place of his own. I think the obvious next step for him was to be able to have his daughter stay with him and we couldn't see him progressing any further without that access and it's not possible in a place like this. this. This isn't where you want to bring a, a young child, so. So he had to move out, really, so that they could form part of his progress and, yeah. and his yeah. healing, if you like. Yeah. So we got in touch with the council and said, you know, we feel that this, this guy's ready to, to move on and get his own tenancy. With the help of the trust and the right benefits in place, Simon was able to move into a property of his own and live independently in a flat provided by the council. Russell and the other staff at the hostel, they played a massive part in me getting where I am today, in me getting my flat, to me building my future. I have the odd days where I'm not, you know, too clever, but most of my days are, a lot of them are a lot, lot better. Simon now lives independently. He volunteers part-time for a local charity, and he hopes to be off employment and support allowance and earning a wage again very soon. But most importantly, he's been able to get back together with his daughter. To have my daughter back in my life is priceless. I can have her here whenever I want, spend as much time as I, as I want. Um, it's our flat. We've, um, we've decorated it for us. And I'm really happy. I'm really happy because at one time I was really doubting whether it was actually going to happen again, whether I could actually have a relationship with my daughter again. And that is really scary, that is. Twelve months have passed since Simon spent that first night in the car. I'm here to check out his new pad, see how much his life has changed. And we're only just just more than a year now yeah since you had your episode shall we yeah. call it that yeah. you know since you were sleeping in the car it feels to me like you've come a long way oh i have yeah i've come a real long way you're now in a frame of mind that that is how different to when you were back in the car oh loads different i've actually got a life now you know i'm able to have a daughter well able to look at you know have her at weekends look after her where before uh, I wouldn't have been able to manage that. Simon's really doing quite quite well at the moment. Um, he's coping a lot better than he did. He still has um, moments where things aren't going very well and he still feels a bit low. We're here for him, um, he knows that. And, you know, we just look forward to seeing, seeing him build his future. What are they providing for you now? They still um, pro provide me with help, support. Anytime I've got any problems, 24 hours a day. I could still walk in there any time I want. I was a, a very proud man who didn't want to involve other people, but sometimes in life, you have to. The guys that you know, how would you describe them? They put people's lives, you know, back on track. I mean, that's priceless. That is priceless. How can somebody can do that? So look at me. I, you know, I, I sorted my life out. I've now got a life again. You know, I, I'm proud of what they've done. They, they really are. They, they'll go to any length to help you. It's almost a crash course in depression and homelessness. Yes. What, what have you discovered, do you think, about yourself and about those, those two things? Well, I hit so low, didn't think I had a life, and I've discovered new things about myself, how to deal with the life, how to deal with the problems, and it, I may not be doing it the way I used to do it, but I've had to do it different ways. Still a work in progress? Yeah. Still a long way to go? Yeah. But I've come a long way as well.
my son the best of luck yeah. I hope it all works out and uh, stay on that path I will do thanks Simon thought his life as a family man was all mapped out and that he'd be with his daughter and his wife until their last days together in the blink of an eye, that changed. And although he tried to cope with it by himself, he couldn't. He needed help from this place. They've helped him realise that although many things have changed, one thing hasn't. He's still a devoted dad. Time now to return to the seedy and greedy world of our money-hungry scroungers. Spiritualist leader Yunus Algahar had been unable to work since 1999 due to migraines and living on benefits. Suspected of living in luxurious properties in Surrey and Kent, with you and I the taxpayer picking up half the tab, His Holiness was being investigated by the local council. Here at Rygate and Banstead, we do have a zero tolerance approach to, to fraud, so we investigate and pursue each case that comes up and we recover fairly substantial amounts of money. Having spotted a pattern in the fraud, investigators had to get to the bottom of how Yunus Algahar was affording such high rents and deposits. On paper, he was living on benefits, but there seemed to be much more money floating around. So, where was it coming from? From looking at the, the kind of paperwork, I was able to look into Yunus Algahar's uh, finances. I noticed that he was declared that he held two, two bank accounts, which hadn't been declared for, for benefit purposes. These hidden accounts suggested that Algahar wasn't leading the modest lifestyle of a spiritual leader living on benefits. I noticed there was a lot of payments being made, uh, especially to uh, flight companies uh, and hotels abroad, as well as payments in foreign currency. Uh, and there were also lots of, of debits that were coming in, um, suggesting there was some form of either um, earned or unearned income going into the account as well. But where was all the money coming from? It was coming in and going out. And he seemed to be a bit of an international traveller, with a taste for the high life. The, the overseas payments on the bank statements showed that there were payments we made in foreign currency, including uh, Sri Lankan rupee, American dollars uh, and in euros over in France as well. Um, as well as payments we made uh, such as on to uh, in-flights uh, payments for duty free and, and to airways as well. With undeclared bank accounts and large payments being made and received, the investigator got on the phone to the Department for Work and Pensions, who'd been paying Yunus Algahar income support for over four years to the tune of £54,682, to which he was almost certainly not entitled. The two organisations combined forces. With the help of the investigators digging, Rygate and Bromley Council and the DWP now had some very difficult questions for Algahar to answer. With the help of Surrey police, it was time for them to pay him a visit, to gather some hard evidence on the source of his undisclosed income and to find out whether he genuinely was living the kind of lifestyle that you'd expect from someone dependent on benefits. At 7am on a morning in November 2011, the team struck. At the time of the, the raid, it was early one morning, um, Yunus Algahar was not actually present at the, um, at the property, however, the, um, the operation continued uh, regardless. A lot of documents that were, that were found in the property and a lot of documents were seized. Um, and these are documents relating to his, his current or, or previous tenancies that he held um, in relation to his income and also in relation to, to the claims that he'd made for benefits to build up a picture of his, his finances and, and, and his lifestyle. These documents provided the proof that Algahar had made false claims relating to his rental agreements and earnings. Investigators were also surprised by the huge haul of technical hardware, including mobile phones, laptops, and large screen TVs found at the property. There's no strict rules as to um, what kind of possessions a person can have when they're claiming benefits. Um, there's nothing to stop a benefit claim having large TVs and lots of computer equipment. However, it depends how those items have been funded, which may set, uh, raise alarm bells. Algahar wasn't at home for the raid, but later on handed himself into a local police station where he was interviewed under caution. Yunus Algahar was presented with uh, the evidence that had been obtained um, during the, the investigation and the subsequent search of his property, uh, and he was asked to comment on all, all the pieces of the evidence that were put before him. In spite of all the evidence of three false housing benefit claims and defrauding the DWP, Algahar remained tight-lipped. At the start of the interview, Eunice Algahar confirmed his, his name and identity details, um, but gave a no-comment interview when the questions and evidence were put before him. 
but there was one thing that came across very clearly from His Holiness. Despite giving a, a no-comment interview, uh, Yunus Algar came across as uh, polite and kind during, during the interview. With undeclared bank accounts and large sums of money being credited and debited, the investigators believed that Yunus Algar was a man who was not entitled to benefits, and the case was passed on to the decision makers. Uh, the decision makers are trained benefit entitlement assessors uh, within an authority such as the council or the Department of Work and Pensions who review claim paperwork and evidence and they, they use this to decide whether a claimant is entitled to benefits or not. Uh, the DWP decision makers made the initial decision um, and they decided that Unis Alcohol was not entitled to income support um, which creates an overpayment of £54,682. Um, the decision maker at Rygate Maxi Borough Council then reviewed the evidence and they also decided that Unis Alcohol was not entitled to his housing benefit or council tax benefit for the entirety of his claim. It's created an overpayment of £3,498 housing benefits and £1,058 council tax benefit. But it didn't stop there. There was the property in Keston to take into account too. The case then passed the decision maker at London Borough of Bromley, who also decided that Eunice Alcar was not entitled to his housing benefit covering the entirety of his claim. This created an overpayment of £16,110. They also removed his entitlement to council tax benefit, creating an additional overpayment of £2,295. That's a staggering £77,646 fleeced from the taxpayer by His Holiness, who gallivanted around the globe, staying in luxurious hotels and treating himself to duty-free. Algahar was taken to court facing 12 charges of dishonesty under the Social Security Administration Act of 1992, but he pleaded not guilty despite the overwhelming evidence against him. Two months later, he changed his mind. Uh, at the, the plea and case management hearing in June 2013, uh, Eunice Algahar changed his plea and eventually pled guilty to uh, 11 of the 12 charges. Algahar was found not guilty of the 12th charge against him. At the sentencing hearing, his QC argued against a prison sentence due to his work with the Messiah Foundation International, where he was an important figure in the fight against extremism. Eunice Algahar was not sentenced to prison, however he was handed three concurrent uh, imprisonment sentences which were um, suspended for 18 months, uh, the longest of which was being 36 weeks. Perhaps he was able to walk from the court a free man because in between pleading guilty and the sentencing hearing, although not implicated in any way in his crime, the Messiah Foundation International dug deep and repaid the £75,585 overpayment in full. That really is divine intervention and the money is now back in the public purse. Algahar was ordered to do 240 hours of community service and pay costs of £6,000. The repaid money uh, has gone back into the public purse and it can now be used to provide benefits to those who are in a genuine need for benefits assistance. Uh, we are very satisfied with the outcome of the case um, and it vindicates the work that the team put in to securing the conviction. It was a very sizeable amount of money um, and I think the sanctions that the court have put in place reflect the seriousness and we are making very clear that we will publicise this fact, the successful prosecution, to deter other people in future. To the members of the Messiah Foundation, Eunice Algahar was someone who, for three years, had chosen to abstain from all but the basic necessities of life. Unfortunately, that didn't include housing and council tax benefit and income support. On the plus side, he is now once again working in the community.